On today's episode, we talk about why Logan Stankoven fell in the 2021 NHL draft. We talk about Matt Rempe's road to the NHL. And we end things off by talking about Connor Bedard being back in action on today's episode of Locked On NHL Prospects. You are Locked On NHL Prospects, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Hello and welcome back to Locked On NHL Prospects, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. On this podcast, we talk about everything prospects related for you five days a week, Monday to Friday. I'm Hattie Kalakesh, joined by Sebastian High, and on today's show, we're going to start things off by talking about Logan Stankoven, who just scored his first NHL goal and got his first NHL assist on his birthday. We'll, have, we'll talk about why he fell in the 2021 NHL draft. He was drafted 47th overall. If you look back, there are, lots of, there are a lot of weird decisions that led up to that. Uh, we'll get into all that on uh, this first segment. We'll also talk about Matt Rempe's road to the NHL and some concerns with his future, um, you know, given the style that he plays in our second segment here. And that will completely flip things over to Connor Bedard. Um, can't name you two more different players than Rempe and Bedard. Uh, but we'll, we'll try, we're going to talk about Connor Bedard being back in the NHL um, and what he's done since his return and how it's helped the Chicago Blackhawks as well. Uh, but before we get into any of that, today's episode is brought to you by Sleeper. Download the Sleeper app and use promo code LOCKEDONNHL to, de- to get up to a $100 match on your first deposit. Terms and conditions apply. Sleep- see Sleeper's terms of use for details. If you're watching on YouTube, make sure to like and subscribe. Leave us a comment letting us know what you want us to talk about next. And if you're listening on your favorite podcasting platform, make sure to make us your first listen of the day. So, Sebastian, I think we can get things started with Logan Stanko, and a personal favorite of both of ours, um who's been producing really, really well in the AHL and finally got a call up um, 57 points in 47 games in the AHL as a 21 year old. Um, well, what's, what's the deal here? Like why, why did he slip this much? Do you think? Ooh, I mean the 2021 draft was a really interesting one. I know Stankoven was a player that I myself uh, would have been sprinting to the podium to draft around 30th overall on yeah. draft day, uh, and and I think he was my my best player available from like 25th overall onwards. Um, yeah. And he fell to 47th, and the Dallas Stars made a uh, pretty easy selection in in adding him there. Uh, and while this was a draft class that was certainly impacted by the lack of a full season. Uh, because it, this was in the midst of uh, the COVID pandemic and uh, the sample for a lot of these players was restricted to just a single U18 tournament along with D-1 uh, game tape, which yeah. definitely throws a bit of a wrench into the prospect analysis side of things. But uh, the thing with Stankoven is that he's always had a combination that looks like it would thrive at the NHL level and two games in it seems to be the case and if the AHL tape is anything to to add to that it's also certainly supporting it but Stankoven combines high end intelligence a unbelievable level of intensity and grit and feistiness with a real nose for the net and the back of the net. He is a really good shooter. He's a really, he's started to master the give and go uh, in transition where he's keeping his puck touches a lot shorter and his handling skill is slightly above average. He's not like a Brendan Gallagher where uh, you have that feistiness, but the handling skill lets him down in all situations. Stankoven is quite versatile with the puck on a stick as well. So he gets to dangerous areas and he has all the tools he needs to put the puck into the back of the net while also elevating his line mates, which was the case in his draft year. We saw it at that U18 uh, tournament in 2021, and uh, he rocketed up every single prospect ranking list in the year since then with his WHL performances and now his AHL performances and now, very recently, the two NHL games. And uh, scoring on his birthday and adding an assist is not half bad, is it? Absolutely, yeah. Getting his NHL start um, recently, uh, it's been really clear that Logan Stankoven has the NHL tools. Like he's able to to play that style, to play that game, and I think that game um, that he that he played, where he scored that goal and, and that assist, I think was a great reflection of what he does so well. Um, even you know, if if you watch his NHL goal, um, I mean, Wyatt Johnson did all the work there. He just yeah. shoved his way through three players. 
But what I really love from Logan Stankov in there is how he paced his route. Like Logan Stankov in a year or two ago would have just jumped into that rush, would have just shoved his way through that pressure and found a way to to just kind of dig that puck out by sheer will and try something. But that wasn't the play that needed to, to be done on that specific instance. What he did instead is he paced himself. He waited for the play to develop and, and kind of just lurked above the play, lurked above the puck and, you know, waited for, for it to pop out. Um, and it did. And he got the puck and it, I honestly like did not think Logan Stackoven could release that quickly off of reception or after off a retrieval. Um, but yeah, he was just able to just completely just shoot that puck right away and right through the goaltender um, for his first NHL goal. I thought that game was a great success in terms of Logan Sankovan showing that, you know, despite his size, he's able to kind of outwork opponents down low, you know, outthink them in transition. Just, you know, I think it's a fantastic element of his game. Um, and it's one that 99% of the time will lead to NHL success, which is why I'm so confused because there was no mystery here regarding Logan Stankoven's work rate, right? Like this has always been a thing. Oh, it's it's always been the thing with, with Stankoven. And, and like, yes, he is five foot eight and he's currently 170 pounds, but he's really, really solid. Like he keeps the center of gravity very low. He uses his size to out leverage opponents and he uses it to really gain entry into high danger areas and into that net front area. Um, and he's able to really use his size to his advantage to get into those spots, which is really key for a player of that stature to excel at the National Hockey League level. And yeah. I think that the other thing with Stankoven that has really enabled this uh, rocket ship of a progression over the last three or four years has been his complete lack of hesitation in this game. He is very, very confident in his style of play. He's confident mm -hmm. in his tools. He's confident in his habits. He is confident in his ability to make a change when he's on the ice and to really be may not necessarily a game breaker at the NHL level but he certainly is that at the in the AHL and was that in the WHL and yeah. there's a real level of confidence with that and with that comes a lack of hesitation and I think that also goes a little bit with uh, the confidence to pull off that shot immediately uh, in his second ever NHL game on his birthday there was no hesitation on that release as you mentioned yeah. he it was he was there and it was immediately off of his stick. That lack of hesitation is really, really key to what makes him such a projectable pro player. And it's also why he's been excelling at the pro rank so far. Yeah, absolutely. And I think that comes with, um, I think that really comes with seeing that your play style works against men, uh, which yes. is why it's, it was so key to give Stankoven the full ride in the WHL, have him hit the NHL once he's, you know, a full grown adult. Well, I mean, you know, he is 5'8", but still, uh, <laughs> I mean, we're talking about a player who, you know, took his sweet time in the WHL, uh, rode the pine, did the whole, w you know, World Juniors route until his last year of eligibility and hit the AHL only once he was ineligible for the dub, right? So, um, you know, I think this route was really, really smart with Stankoven and we're seeing the dividends right now. But, you know, just to kind of sum things up here, why did he fall? Is it really just his size? And if so, like, how? when is this going to stop? Like, when, when are we going to get past this whole size complex in the NHL for players who clearly have first round value. I'm not talking about like third, fourth, fifth round prospects who, you know, don't necessarily have that high end skill, um, but have more skill and are undersized. Like it's still nice to take shots on those guys, but you can afford, you know, to, to go for a bigger guy. But I'm talking about like bona fide first round value talent that slips yeah. into the second because of their size. Like when, when do you think that's going to stop? I mean, I, I think I think it's shifting slowly. It's not a quick change necessarily, but yeah. like Stankoven put up 29 goals and 48 points in 59 games as a D minus one, and then in the six WHL games he did get to play in his draft year, he logged seven goals and 10 points. Like yeah. there was enough of a sample for it to be very clear that there was significant upside in this player. I would mm -hmm. assume that a lot of NHL teams were scared off by the fact that he plays the style he does at the size that he is. But I think I, I remember from my, my, my own personal viewings from that draft year, it took me maybe three viewings to be really confident that his style would translate to the NHL just because yeah. of 
everything falling in line with him. Like he has all the tools, he has all the habits, he he has the intelligence, and he does not stop trying until it works. And and that has been the case uh, going back to his D minus one, and that incessant work rate is really what allows his entire game to tick, and uh, it is ticking all right. Yeah, for sure. And, you know, if you look at the players I was drafted in front of him, all I'm going to say is Dallas Star fans are probably very happy that the 2021 draft uh, worked out the way it did. But that wraps things up for our first segment. We'll get into our second where we talk about uh, and Matt Rempe's road to the NHL and some concerns regarding CTE with young players. All that coming up after these messages from our sponsors over at Sleeper. It's past the halfway point of the NHL season, but you can still get in on the action with Sleeper. Sleeper is our number one choice for all of your daily fantasy hockey needs here at the Locked On NHL Podcast Network. That's because with Sleeper, you can win 100 times your cash in daily fantasy hockey contests. And all you have to do to get that is to correctly predict the outcome of eight specific player stats. And you can get really creative with that, whether you want to play it safe and bet that Nikita Kucherov is going to continue lighting up the league, or maybe add a little bit of spice into the equation, go for some of the young guns and go into go in with the topic of this specific podcast with, I don't know, maybe a prediction of Matthew Rempe in penalty minutes or Connor Bedard with points scored. The choice is yours with sleeper use promo code lockdown nhl and you'll get up to a 100 dollars match on your first deposit terms and conditions apply that's code locked on nhl see sleepers terms of use for details and locational availability all righty so moving on to our second segment we're going to be talking about matt rempe's road to the nhl because it is an interesting one um and we'll also talk about some concerns with the style of play and you know whether young players should be kind of doing this, but let's start off with kind of the road to the NHL here. So Matt Rempe, 6'7", 241, um, was about the same size when he was drafted in the 2020 NHL draft in the sixth round at 165th overall. If you look at his stat line um, with the Seattle Thunderbirds, for a big guy, it wasn't that bad. Um, 31 points in 47 games. Um, It was a really good team, but, you know, at the end of the day, it is... It's decent enough uh, production for a big guy to get drafted, I think, earlier than that. Um, But still, he gets drafted uh, the next season, you know, COVID pandemic, all that stuff, only plays eight games in the WHL and puts up five points. Um, But did play a two-game stint with the Spruce Grove Saints in the AJHL, which is not something you usually see. Um, But then as the years go on, the production doesn't go up, but I think the play style changed a bit. Um, Rempe became a lot more of a bruiser, a lot more of a goal scorer, kind of off puck mover, puck tipper in the net front, that kind of thing. So he puts up 17 goals and six assists in 20 uh, in 56 games um, with the Thunderbirds again, wearing reigning an A on his shirt this time, and puts up 93 penalty minutes. And I think this is where we start to see the Matt Rempe we're going to see in the NHL. Um, the year after that, he ages out, uh, goes to the Hartford Wolf Pack in the AHL, uh, the New York Rangers affiliate team. Um, Puts up 10 points in 53 games and 87 penalty minutes in his first season against pros. And now this year he's in the NHL. Uh, Five games, two points, 32 penalty minutes in five games, which is absurd. Um, And more of the same in the AHL before he got called up. 12 points in 43 games with 96 penalty minutes. So the road to the NHL has been a a definite strange one. Not one you'd usually see this quickly for a player of this type. Um, uh, drafted this low, especially. Uh, but yeah, you know, is it interesting to see this going? Cause like, I mean, it's rare to see six round picks make the NHL. Right. Um, and, and have that be a six, eight to 40, um, kind of, you know, um, I don't know how else to call them just like an enforcer. Right. Um, is it interesting to see, you know, this type of player make the NHL this quickly? Certainly. I mean, the enforcer role is never one that was really attuned for 21 year olds and yeah. probably for the best um, <laughs> in terms of, of, of protecting brain development a little bit. Oh, uh, sure. But but I found it very interesting just how many headlines this players already received, despite having a cumulative less than 20 minutes of total NHL time on ice at the time of recording. <laughs> yeah. And I've seen like 
eight million highlights of his fights already, uh, just, just just by being on social media, and he he's certainly making those headlines. He's he's drawing attention, and for a young player who has what four fights in his first five NHL games to be attracting such attention is. On the one hand, I'm sure very exciting for the player himself and for Rangers fans. And on the other hand, a little bit concerning for his well-being, right? Yeah, no, absolutely. Um, I mean, just watching him, like 13 seconds into his first shift against the New Jersey Devils, he got a game misconduct and got kicked out. Like, game misconduct, a fight, and then got kicked. It's just, you know, I'm concerned for this player mainly mainly because he's playing a role that, that sees him play such little ice time. Um, but in, in return, it causes great, I mean, consequences for his overall development. We're talking about a player who, you know, at his size, throwing the punches that he does and facing guys like Nick Delorier and like some of the best fighters in the NHL, like he's, he's trying to make a name for himself clearly. And I think the result of that is he's taking a lot of really, really big headshots. Like this is, this is a player who's, I mean, he got, he got he got his, his butt handed to him uh, a couple times in these fights. And it's just, it's a concern because he's 21. His brain hasn't developed yet. Isn't even close to developing yet. Um, you know, and, and we're, we're already throwing him into the ring against the biggest fighters in the NHL. Like, do you see, do you see this really? I mean, he was called up for this specific reason, but do you see this as kind of a healthy thing for a 21 year old to be doing? I think that's something that once your brain develops, do whatever you want, but like, is this not a bit too early? Yeah. I I mean, like this is a player who is a, like a couple months younger than me. And I know yeah. that I, I don't think that I'm personally at a point where getting punches to the head consistently night in night out is, would be healthy necessarily. Oh yeah. No, um, sure. But, <laughs> but I mean, we, we, we saw a similar thing happen with Arbor Jacki last season where in the first like two months of his NHL career, he was fighting like left, right and center and he was beating people and everyone was like, oh my God, this is the greatest enforcer of our time. Will he keep doing it? And it's really slowed down. It has subsided and, and he's settling into more of a role of playing hockey while on the ice and trying to take less penalties and spending less time in the penalty box, which yeah. has been really good for his on ice development and i'm sure hasn't hurt his off ice development either and i i would hope a similar thing could happen with rempe i think that the the thing that, that that that's really intriguing from his perspective is that he has a talent that is getting him on the map like he he could forge a career out of this because yeah. he is so massive and he is making headlines already that is a possibility at the same time, is it worth it? I don't know. I, I don't think that's necessarily for us to necessarily debate here of whether or not yeah. that's a worthwhile personal choice because it is just a very personal choice. But yeah, I don't think it I don't think it's right that that the organization is embracing this to the extent that they are and are just putting him out him out for 17 seconds a night before he gets a fight in the game misconduct. I don't think that yeah. really helps anyone. Like the team plays with, with one less player, the player could get injured and also settling into a role that that, that, is, that is that specific and that limiting <sighs> who knows but it, yeah. it's 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 the modern nhl like we still have fighting in the game it's still part of the game it's part of the rules and uh fans are going to appreciate it for as long as it remains a part of the game and rempe's fights have been electric like it, it, it is certainly entertaining but there are other sports that bring fighting in an entertaining way that is also in a far more safe environment than on ice surface on knife shoes with no fight training yeah no for sure i think the other side of that is because there are less and less enforcers in the nhl the one that are the ones that are left are the best are in the NHL. yeah they are yeah so, so it's it's not like he has much choice if he's gonna drop the gloves it's gonna be against the the best you know fighters currently available so it's just Won't be you know Connor Bedard, i'll tell you that much that's for sure he's not dropping his gloves against matt rempe but speaking of which we'll get into him in the third segment and talk about what he's been doing since he's come back from injury i will get into that rather these messages from our sponsors um here at Camino Consulting our sponsor once again today is Camino Consulting 
you've he- you've already heard of their online families and couples course, which we talked about uh, last week. Um, and if you've taken an advantage of a 25% discount running to the end of the month for those, uh, you'll also love their live seminars. Uh, in both sport and business, the challenge in dif- differentiating candidates and recruits it's an endless battle. I mean, everyone can demonstrate their measurables and qualifications, but we all know it's the intangibles that matter uh, when those things are so similar. So contact Camino Consulting for their team and management seminars to get a peek behind the curtain and watch your next recruiting class or hiring group become one of the most effective you've ever seen, both because you've identified the right candidates and because you've learned how to communicate and motivate them in accord with their preferences. But you aren't, if you, but if you aren't in business management or working with a team, they do referrals. Uh, you can make some money by ha- making your workplace and t- favorite teams better. Every group works together better at the end of their year, uh, more than at week one. So contact Camino Consulting at CaminoConsulting.ca and get on the fast track to understanding. Alrighty, so to close things off, uh, we're going to be talking about Connor Bedard being back in the NHL, baby. Let's get it done. So he's got seven points in six games since his return. Six of those came in his first three games since being back from that jaw injury, that awful jaw injury he got um, uh, earlier in, I, th- I think it was January, right? Or was it early was January? It December? Early January, right. So yeah, since then, um, averaging about uh, 20 minutes a night. Uh, as usual, um, I mean, the, the Blackhawks have lost six of the seven games since he's been back. But still, I think that Connor Bernard is um, just inevitable in scenarios like these. He's Especially those first three games since he came back, he was on fire. I think there was one specific move he pulled off in transition that everyone was like, whoa, he can do that? Uh, yeah, he can. That's it's Connor Bernard. Um, it was a really interesting move. He carried the puck in lifted the opponent's stick, well, actually whacked the opponent's stick a couple times just to get him to get both sticks on, both hands on the on the stick, right? As soon as he gets both hands on the stick, Bedard's able to just whiff it between his legs and shoot a backhand shot in motion. Um, but I thought it was really interesting just adding in those couple of stick taps on the, on his stick just to make sure that that defender had both hands on his on his, on his stick there, right? Because if he has one hand on the stick, He's able to, to just, you know, moving and, and poke that puck out. So it's just sure. really intelligent decision-making from Connor Bedard in transition. But, yeah, you know, what's it been like since he's returned? I mean, more or less the usual, but I, I think that, you know, the production's gone up a bit in that in that span. And I think he set himself up for, like, long-term NHL success um, just being back for that injury, correct? For sure. I mean, it, it, it's still Connor Bedard that that hasn't changed here, and yeah, I guess like, like the one nice thing about it being a jaw injury is that it doesn't really get in the way of hockey, and it doesn't like he can still rest his jaw and it can still keep healing now that he's he's, he's playing games. Um, yeah. But but no, he's he's still the same player. Like he's he's still thinking the game at the same pace. He's still. Uh, it's still showing off the same level level of dare and and trying to do things and trying to push his limits and to see what he's still able to do uh, in this league in this setting. And uh, it's been continuously very clear that, Ch- that, the, that the Chicago Blackhawks become about four times more in, in, exciting to watch when he's on the ice compared to when he's not. Yeah, absolutely. Um, fun fact: he has um, he has he has points on sixty percent of the Blackhawks' goals since coming back. <laughs> this is just, I mean, this kid is oh, like yes, he, he has seven points, and the Blackhawks have twelve goals in that in that span. Like math wise, that's absurd. He's basically their 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 lead player, their only you know pro player of note, and it's obvious on every single shift that you know not, no one really competes with Connor Bedard in terms of skill set on that roster. Um, I, I think that's one element that's going to make it really easy for him to take this team by the reins, even when they add, you know, five, six, seven prospects um, from the pipeline into the roster that become bona fide NHLers, bona fide top six forwards, bona fide top four defensemen, you name it. I think this season being the Blackhawks, like by far the Blackhawks best player and, um, you know, kind of taking that team by the reins, it becomes super easy heading forward, right? Like this is a great position for Connor Bedard to be in. It is, and, and and the Blackhawks have a a ever increasing pool of of high end prospects, and yeah. I would be curious of of all the forward prospects in Chicago's core, which two do you think would be the most complimentary line mates uh, in a top six with Connor Bedard? Oh, that one's easy. Uh, Oliver Moore and Frank Nazar. Um, yeah, but I think Oliver Moore is probably going to be kind of the two C behind them. Um, 
But I think when you place more with Bedard and Nazar, when you make that decision as a team, like that's that's a great combination of skills. We've got more who's got the the just pure speed element. He's just able to blast through, uh, uh, play the four check, play defensively, and just kind of blast his way up and down the ice. Then you've got Frank Nazar, who's got the dynamic ability, the lateral mobility, the um, the ability, and, and also the work rate as well to keep up with Oliver Moore on those four checks. And then you can have um, Connor Bedard as your F3, just waiting for a puck to pop loose and just fire it in the back of the net. It becomes a super easy role for him. Um, but yeah, anyone else you've kind of put in that conversation in terms of great line mates for, for Bedard? Not really. I think those, those were the obvious ones. I think like one more... Um that I might throw in there. Oh, why is his name escaping me? The sniper from Hamilton, Nick Lardis. I think Nick, Nick Lardis, Lardis could yeah. be fun. Um, but, but that would be really, if he reaches his absolute ceiling and could be a complimentary scorer on a top line, but, but Oliver Moore and Frank Nazar are the obvious stylistic fits. It's more just a question of is Chicago willing to put their three top centers of the future on one line together? Uh, and I don't know if that's going to be a yes. I will throw one last name in there, and it's Ryan Green out of the out of Boston University. Ooh, um, good. You talk about player, piece. Yeah, like you talk about a player who can who can make space for Bedard in the offensive zone. A player who can um, stick handle his way out of trouble fairly well. Like you know, he he's he's surprised me a couple times with his ability to dig through opponents to kind of keep pucks on his backhand, shield the puck, you know, uh, drive to the net, that kind of stuff. But mainly, it's just. I think it'd be a really interesting kind of addition to uh, a line, you know, for example, if you have a line of green Bedard and Nazar instead of, you know, more Bedard and Nazar, um, that's a great combo of skills. You've got, you know, two really dynamic players of a more straightforward player who can still deke his way through trouble. Um, so I, I think that'd be a great combination of skills. Outside of that, though, the, the Blackhawks could use another draft of, of tanking and adding some, some interesting tools sure. to organization as, you know, once you hit the defense, it's Sam Renzel, Kevin Korczynski, that's it. Um, yeah, I, I think I think as soon as Lucas Reichel, um, you know, is, is you know, I, I think Lucas Reichel and Conor Bedard are a great pair, you know, in, in, in the NHL. Um, and I think that's going to stay that way. And once... Once Frank Nazar gets added into that or into that conversation, once Oliver Moore gets added to that conversation, it's going to be it's going to be between those two to play beside Reichel and Bedard. Because I mean, those two are already developing some interesting tools together. So, yeah. Um, overall, that that's mainly it. Um, anyone else you see as kind of interesting prospects in the Blackhawks pool before we close things off? Doesn't necessarily have to be like a, a line mate for Bedard, but just overall. Yeah, I think like like just overall, like I think the last two I would highlight would be Ethan Del Mastro as an interesting potential like number five, number four defenseman moving forward. Really solid, and he's at about half a point a game in the AHL so far this season. Uh, with 26 points in 50 games with Rockford. And the last one I'll, I'll give a little shout out to is Martin Mishiak. Uh, he, oh, yeah. he just transitioned to the OHL this season. He was just drafted last year. And the production isn't the greatest. Like he's at 37 points through 49 games. But the the important thing with Mishiak is the, uh, the work rate, the defensive habits, uh, the off-puck habits in general. He supports his line mates really well, makes the lives of his line mates a lot easier. And and is all in all a really easy player to respect uh, stylistically. So he, he's one that I think is going to be pretty fun in, in Chicago's bottom six moving forward. Oh, for sure. Absolutely. But that wraps things up for today's show. Thank you very much for tuning in. If you're watching on YouTube, make sure to like and subscribe. Leave us a comment letting us know what you want us to talk about next. And if you're listening on your favorite podcasting platform, make sure to make us your first listen of the day. For your second listen of the day, make sure to check out Locked On Sports Today to get all your news and updates about what's going on around sports. And make sure to tune in for our next show as we, as we break down the Dauber Prospects mid-season rankings for the 2024 NHL Draft. This has been Hattie Kalakesh with Sebastian High, and we hope you tune in next time.